for this video, it's just a couple things I want to chat about. Hey booktube, it's Kim at middle of the book march, and as I just said, this is just a chat. I have a little housekeeping to do, <clears throat> and I uh, have a few things that I had read about lately I just wanted to talk to you about, and I just want to talk about one book very quickly, and it's not a review yet, I'll be doing that over the weekend. So let's do housekeeping first. In my Bookish Week video last week, last Sunday, I said that I'm going to be making a change in the Blind Eye Book Club, but what I'm, and that's true, what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the book for August. And August, I picked um, Remarkable Creatures by Tracy Chevalier to read. And I, I'm going to change that because August is typically Women in Translation Month. And so I thought I would uh, read Remarkable Creatures at a different time. But for August, I wanted to replace that book with a book from a woman in translation. And this is Daughters of Fortune by Isabel Allende. Let's do this. And it's an older copy, so it does have that permanent Oprah sticker on it. Um, this was written in 1999, and it is translated from the Spanish by Margaret Sayers Peden, P-E-D-E-N. Now, just check out this end paper. My goodness. At first I thought, did somebody draw that on and just put it in the book? But I looked on the back page as well, and it's, it's there as well. It's black lace. It's so pretty. So, Daughter of Fortune, uh, Isabel Allende is a Chilean author, and um, just thought I wanted to put this in for Women in Translation in August. Very quickly, this is a story set in the mid-1800s, and it's a woman named Eliza Summers. She's raised in the British colony of Valparaiso, Chile, by a well-intentioned Victorian spinster, Miss Rose, and her more rigid brother, Jeremy. Uh, there is a young clerk named Joaquin who um, she falls in love with, who Eliza falls in love with. And eventually, gold is discovered in California. So Joaquin decides to travel to California to make his fortune in gold. And uh, Eliza has become pregnant with his baby. So eventually, she decides to follow him. And then plot ensues. Uh, she's on a hunt for him and she's pregnant at the same time so there's a lot of story that happens does she find him who helps her along the way does she have a baby where does she end up so yeah that's that's a uh, daughter of fortune and i'm really looking forward to reading this again it's another book i've had forever and as you can tell because the oprah sticker is on it it's an older copy and that's what we're going to be reading in august for the blind eye book club Daughter of Fortune by Isabel Allende, translated from the Spanish by Margaret Sayers Peden. So if you're in, involved in the club or interested in this book, join me. Um, the next book I want to quickly talk about, this is not a wrap up. I just have some, I have some feelings that I wanted to share in a chatty video, but I just finished Lessons in Chemistry by Bonnie Garmus. I'm not going to tell you what I think about the book. I already gave it a star rating on Goodreads. If you're super curious, you can go and look what I rated it. But I just have to talk about this cover. For so many reviews that I've already seen on BookTube, Heidi from My Reading Life is one BookTuber who also talked about this. This cover is one of the worst cover decisions in publishing. Because what this cover does is it gives the, the book a tone of chiclet. In covers on books, kind of, I'm hoping, will spell out the tone of the book, maybe point towards what the story could be about. And this one just looks like a summer beach read book. If I gathered correctly, I, I got wind of the author herself, Bonnie Garmus, who made a comment about this cover and how much she disliked it. And authors do have some sort of input or a light decision in what cover goes on their books, but she, I don't believe she likes this one. It, it's, it's almost, it's almost insulting in a way because this book is not a, 
beach read per se. You can read any book you want on the beach. You can read, you know, War and Peace on the beach if you want. But we all know what I say when I say beach read. There's a certain genre, there's a certain stereotype of a book that readers will say this is a great beach read. It's a great book to take on the beach. And this looks like kind of a comic strip, kind of a caricature. There's, you know, there's scientific equipment in the reflection of her glasses. And, but the rest of the cover is like, it, it looks kind of fluffy and um, comical. And this, there's certain parts of the, this book that are very funny and joyful to read. But this cover is such an illusion and I hate it. And so many other readers have hated it. And there are so many readers out there that just simply don't care what the cover of a book looks like. I am not one of them. If you've watched my channel for any, any length of time, you know how I feel about book covers. I never buy a book because of the cover, but I am attracted to books dependent, depending on the cover. I think we all are. Unless we have a title in mind that we're searching out, we're going to be attracted to covers for whatever reason, whether it's our favorite color or whether we're attracted to the aesthetic or the picture on the outside or if it's a photo. We, we will be physically or visually attracted to a book cover, but this one is an awful matchup with this book. So publishers, if you're watching, no. if anybody in publishing is watching, please take to heart my comments. It's not just me. It's so many of us out there, so many readers who can't stand this cover. So that's all I have to say. Okay, that's it for me. But no, it's not it for me. I have a couple of things I wanted to chat about. Um, I read a couple articles, so along with reading actual books, I read about books, and I think a lot of us do that. But I have a lot of online websites and online magazines that I look at. And I'm going, I have two, two articles, and one of them, I don't remember the sources, but I will link everything in the description box below. And if I can, I'll put a picture here from the the front page of the article but there were one, there was one article i read um from an author i believe who was talking about goodreads reviews and the point she made was that there are books that have not even come out yet that people are giving one star reviews for now i think that's interesting because we all know if you're a voracious reader you know that books come out in advanced reader copies all the time. And a lot of people can acquire those via NetGalley online. They can request copies from the publisher. There are many people that publishers send advanced reading copies to. So lot, lots of people are reading books before they are released to the public. And this particular writer of the article was bemoaning the fact that many books that haven't been generally released yet are receiving one-star reviews on Goodreads. And that shouldn't be allowed. So she was bemoaning the fact that that's allowed. Why should it be allowed that people can give a, an unreleased book one star? And honestly, if somebody has actually read an advanced copy and believes it's one star worthy, then they, that's their right to do it. And I think one of her complaints was that if somebody is reading an advanced copy and gives it one star, then that's going to sway somebody else upon general release from reading it. Well, that's what book reviews do anyway. So I, I don't know if the timing is going to make any difference, possibly. Because when a, if a book that's out only in advanced copies receives a one star, and it eventually is generally released onto the table at your biggest chain bookstore, then many readers might take a look at it and say, oh, I saw that it got a one-star review on Goodreads. I'm not going to pick that up after all. Or maybe that will affect um, early purchases or advanced purchases. Maybe the author won't get many of those if there is an early one-star review. Not just one, you know what I mean. But I thought that was really interesting because Goodreads is owned by Amazon. And if anybody has looked into the Amazon review system as well, it's all corrupt. There's You can't really trust anything. Some people give books one stars because it arrived damage in shipping. 
Other people will give a book one star because the Kindle version malfunctioned. And so how can we possibly trust star reviews on Goodreads and Amazon? And honestly, when I put out a star review on Goodreads, it's for my own benefit because I use Goodreads as a database. I only use it to keep track of what I've read and, and the star rating that I think of it. So I don't typically pay attention to others' reviews. Historically, when I've gone back to look at the best of the year for Goodreads books, it's not the best books, it's the most popular. And the most popular usually means the highest grossing in revenue. So I take with a grain of salt any reviews that I see on Goodreads and or Amazon. There are too many instances of Amazon reviewers either being paid to write a specific type of review or slanting the reviews because, you know, they know the author, they are a friend of the author, the author has hired 100 people to put up reviews, who knows? And I also think it's interesting on Goodreads when an author puts up a five-star review of their own book. And it adds to the statistics. So even if it's one author with one five-star review, or who knows, maybe an author creates 100 different Goodreads profiles, who knows? But can we really trust online reviews? And should we really trust online reviews? Um, now, when I say that, what does that mean to booktubers? When I put up a wrap-up and I put up a review of a book that I hated, there are so many other readers who loved it. And if you're a subscriber and you're watching my video, is that going to sway you from picking it up, even if you were initially interested in the topic? Maybe. That's not my intention. My intention is only to sh share with you how I felt about the book. But honestly, isn't that what book reviews are anyway? It's the, uh, it's the subjective opinion of one reader. And honestly, a lot of book reviews in the past have affected my decision to pick up a specific book. Uh, book reviews also can tell you a little bit about what the book is about, about the topic, as long as it doesn't spoil. So more often than not, I will still pick up a book if it got negative ratings, if I am very interested in the story or in the content in, ca in the case of nonfiction. But I thought this was a really interesting article from this person who was bemoaning the Goodreads review process. And honestly, I think we should all take that with a grain of salt. The other article I read had to do with what do you do when your your house is overrun with bookshelves? What do you do when your house is overrun with books? And my first thought was, is that a bad thing? <laughs> is that a thing? Who's afraid of that? And who who does that bother? But, <laughs> you know, for me, I, I don't, I don't feel my house is overrun with books. I have a lot of books, but I don't feel I'm overrun by them. I collect them and I love them. And yes, I, I periodically do unhaul books. And I'm actually getting ready to do that soon. But it's not because they're stressing me out and it's not because I feel overrun or, or overwhelmed by them. But this article was giving the readers advice on what to do if your, your house is overrun with books. And I started to read and I realized a lot of this has to do with interior design. How do you use your books for interior design? And what do you do if you seem to have so many books? How do you design your home around your books? It's like, I didn't ever realize that books were a part of interior design. I discovered this concept several years ago around maybe a year or two before I actually joined BookTube. I realized that people use books as staging and a lot of interior design books and photos, when they show shelves of books or when they show homes with books, those are often staged. And my first reaction was, who does that? If you own books, if you have bookshelves and shelves filled with books in your home, aren't you a reader? And lo and behold, no, not everybody that owns books are readers. What? <laughs> what? And I, I was so dumbfounded by that conclusion. And then I realized as I was doing online book shopping, as I often have been known to do, one of the one of a, a really good place to buy used books or old books or back copies of books you're looking for is Etsy. And I really like Etsy because it supports very small business owners or craftspeople. 
and I have gone on Etsy and found antiquarian copies of books that I love. I'm talking to you, George Eliot. But what, you, what I also found on Etsy were people that were selling bulk quantities of books, whether they were all antiques, whether they were all classics, all paperbacks, but the titles didn't matter. It was the way the books looked. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Why would anybody buy a bunch of books because of the way they looked? And then I saw that you can buy bump, bump, what am I trying to say? You can buy bulk books or bunches of books based on color. I can buy 20 books that are all green. I can buy 12 books that are all classics with red spines. What? <laughs> I can buy a box of classic books just to put on a shelf just to make my room look a certain way. Why would I want to do that? But here I am coming from a very narrow concept of if I have books, I'm reading them. I'm a reader. That's why I have all these books. But that's not the case for everybody. A lot of people put up books to look a certain way. A lot of homeowners want to stage their room to look a certain way for the, again, for the aesthetic, which I hate that word. But a lot of people will put up books to look intellectual. A lot of people will have, it will hire interior designers without a thought and they'll give them ideas of, I, I want the room to look minimalist, but have books to make me look smart. And a designer will come in and will put up the appropriate books on shelves and they'll stage them. They'll put them in the shelves a certain way. They'll put them stacked. They'll have knickknacks next to them. That blew me away. <laughs> And it's so, when I think about it now, it's so naive of me to think that when people have books in their home, they read them all because they don't. And I thought that was so weird, but it's done. And once in a while, I enjoy looking at YouTube of celebrity bookcases or celebrity bookshelves or celebrity libraries. Can I trust them now? Can I trust these celebrities who claim they read? I don't know. Can I trust the celebrity book clubs that say they read? Most likely not. Can I trust any celebrity that's giving me an Architectural Digest tour of their home and they want to show me a personal library? I don't think so. So yeah, I was flabbergasted by that. I thought I'd just hopefully make you laugh and and ask, have, have any of you noticed that? Have you, did you realize that? That people will stage with books? It, again, naive, so. That's all I had to chat about today. Hope you enjoyed it. I'm going to include the links to these two articles in the description box below. And again, the August choice for the Blind Eyed Book Club will be Daughter of Fortune by Isabel Allende. And I'm going to replace the current book with that one. Let me know in the comments below if you have any thoughts and I will see you in the next video. Bye everybody.